Hi, everyone. Welcome to the March 19th edition of the Timeform U.S. Pacecast. I'm David Aragona here with my usual co-host, Craig Milkowski. Back from missing one podcast last week. Unfortunately, I was under the weather for the second half of last week and didn't really have much of a voice for a few days there, so it was sort of physically impossible to put out a Timeform U.S. forecast. We don't like to miss one of those since we enjoy doing them. We know that uh, the listeners like to to take in that podcast, uh, but I don't think that was the worst week to miss. Just not a whole lot of major racing happening around the country, sort of that lull in between the second and third round derby preps. So uh, not the worst forecast to take a week off. I've had bad luck in the past being sick on major racing weekends. There were like a couple of Belmont stakes in a row where I was sick that week and I've been sick on Derby week being sick in the middle of March, not, not the worst thing. So uh, <laughs> sorry to miss last week, uh, but uh, Craig, happy to be back with you for this pace cast this week. Yeah. Happy to have you back. Like you said, it wasn't the worst week, but I am glad you're back because things are about to get pretty hot and heavy with the, the fairgrounds this week. And then I think really big the next week after, but uh, yeah, good to have you back. And we still have some racing to talk about. Uh, I was a little skeptical when I first started putting together the rundown for today's show, but it's not the strongest week we're ever going to talk about, but there are some interesting performances. Yeah, you were putting down to, to get together the rundown this week and sort of noting there weren't too many standout speed figures earned this week, but we did see the returns of some horses, particularly four-year-olds that are kicking off campaigns that I think are at least worth talking about as horses that might be able to take steps forward off of these return races when they step up into stakes company next time. That's sort of a common theme throughout this podcast. So we'll talk about a few of those as we mentioned a, a myriad of circuits on this podcast. We're going to start out at Santa Anita where we'll discuss the San Carlos, their feature race from last Saturday. We'll then move on to Oaklawn Park, where there were some races from last Saturday's card, including a couple of stakes to mention. Gulfstream Park, where we saw some of those uh, four-year-olds returning, including a couple high-profile ones from the Bill Mott Barn. There were a couple of stakes at Gulfstream as well for uh, the three-year-olds. Slower speed figures, but we'll talk about both of those. Then we'll move on to Aqueduct, where I think we saw a nice three-year-old filly winning the Cicada. And then we'll finish things up at Fairgrounds and Laurel which uh, achieved some of the highest speed figures of the week, maybe it's from some unfamiliar horses that we'll discuss a little bit later on in the podcast. Uh, but uh, plenty of circuits to discuss. Craig, though, we're going to begin with a horse that we've mentioned plenty of times on this podcast, and that, of course, was the winner of the Grade 3 San Carlos at Santa Anita last Saturday, the Chosen Vron. You can set your watch to this horse. I mean, he just shows up every month or so and seems to continue winning races at uh, his usual clip. Yeah, he's amazing. I mean, this was his 16th win and 21 starts. Uh, a lot of these I'm not going to have the official speed figure for. Uh, I'll have them later and we'll put them out. I'm guessing the Chosen Vron's going to get about a 118. Uh, so maybe not quite his top effort, but a good strong race from him nonetheless. And just does what he does on most occasions and wins. And I would imagine we're going to keep seeing him in these dirt sprints. And maybe eventually he'll get another uh, crack at the Breeders' Cup. You've just got to admire this horse's consistency at a day and age where the top stars in the sport usually only compete three, four times a season. Uh, this horse is now making already his second start in 2024. He competed seven times last year, and he's just been a win machine. I mean, aside from that Breeders' Cup loss, where he was facing one of the better Breeders' Cup sprint fields that we've seen in recent years, and he finished a respectable fifth that day. He's already run three times since then. If you discount that Breeders' Cup loss, he's won 11 races in a row outside of it. So he's just the picture of consistency. And, you know, Craig, with some of those key retirements from last year, namely the two top two finishers in the Breeders' Cup sprint, horses like Elite Power and Gunite not coming back, uh, it makes the chosen for one of the top sprinters in the country right now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no doubt about it. And, you know, he's a horse who thrives on racing. So I'm hoping he kind of skipped the prep last year as they decided that I think it was a decision to train up to the Breeders' Cup sprint, if memory serves. And hopefully they don't do that this year because he just didn't seem to be quite himself that day. And, um, you know, it's one he just the more he runs, the better he seems to run. And he's a horse that I just think you really have to like. And it's not like there wasn't some horses in here who, at least on paper, looked pretty competitive with him. But it, it just didn't turn out that way once the race was run. Uh, this was a race uh, chosen Veron. We had talked about his last win in the uh, Calbred stakes that he ran in that the pace was just so slow. It probably held his speed figure back and you could 
kind of ignore that number. Not so here. It was a pretty quick pace. And it was also a track that was a little bit odd. So I don't have, I won't have total confidence. I, I'm totally sure that my assistant will break this out from the other races on the uh, card because it just seemed like a much slower track and, until this race at where it suddenly was a lot faster than than all of the previous ones but there were turf races intervening so it, it just wouldn't make sense to use the same variant as all the other races that the chosen Vron would have run like a 145 or something so it was definitely a race that had to be cut out and I want to give a shout out to the runner up in this race Ghost of Midnight who when you watch the replay he was really trying to take a shot at the chosen Vron through the stretch and you could see that Hector Berrios sort of always had the chosen Vron uh you know in a comfortable gear and seemed to have that runner up measured but Ghost of Midnight was really trying hard through the wire and you just have to admire the way this horse has stepped up against tougher company and passed every test after beginning his career in a $20,000 maiden claiming race uh Mark Glatton the connections really got away with one that day he won an eight to one and hasn't been in for a tag since then but he certainly proved himself to be a much higher class horse than what they had initially estimated he would be he's only lost twice in a seven race career and he's been second both times to the likes of the chosen Vron and Hijazi so that's certainly nothing to sneeze at this is a pretty good horse who seemed to legitimize his class against great stakes company here yeah, he is a good horse, and he had won his last two around two turns at Santa Anita, but his best two speed figures have now come in these extended sprints at six and a half and seven. Uh, not saying he can't run well around two turns, but maybe this is really where he's going to shine. Well, let's stick with the older sprint division and transition over to Hot Springs, Arkansas to talk about their feature race at Oaklawn from last Saturday. That was the grade three Whitmore. And this was supposed to be the matchup between Rivet and Tejano Twist, the speed and the closer. But it was another Steve Asmussen trained speed type that actually caused the minor upset here in Jackson Traveler. And this is one of those races, Craig, where there were a few horses with tactical speed on paper and they all just kind of played cat and mouse on the front end. Nobody really wanted to go on with it setting slow fractions jackson traveler got that good trip just perched on the outside and flavian pratt pushed the button a little bit quicker than the other two to his inside and was able to get the jump on him and that proved the difference in the end as he just held off the closer to hano twist yeah, Tahano Twist put on his usual good run, but it was also a race where he faced his usual uh, blue fractions that he just seems to get most times. He almost never seems to get a fast pace. Uh, no, no knocking Jackson Traveler. I mean, he's a horse who ran well, but he kind of took advantage of circumstances. His stablemate Rivet it was out there setting a slow pace along with surveillance and. Those two just seem to have nothing left. Rivet's a real head scratcher. When he shows up, he's really good. And when he doesn't, he's pretty bad. Um, this is a race we're going to do a pace breakout. Uh, if you looked at the chart over the weekend, you probably saw the winner only has a 112. That's actually going to be a 117 when all is said and done. Tejano Twist is actually going to get a bigger figure, probably about a 120, I think it is. Um for the win, overcoming that slow pace almost uh, didn't quite get there. And what was a really close photo, I have to imagine. It was one of those when I watched, I, I couldn't tell who won. Uh, normally I can tell, but not in that one. So pretty good, strong race, but it, it's interesting. It was on the same day as uh, the, the uh, Chosen Veron race. And that's one where we kind of have been down on the California horses. But I actually think those two sprinters we saw out there are probably better than this crew. Yeah, I would agree with that slight pace upgrade that you ultimately settled on. Uh, it's just one of those situations that we've talked about quite a bit, even recently on this podcast, Craig, where you've got these high class horses that sort of get rated when they're capable of going much faster. And it's not always to their benefit. I mean, just look at Rivet when he earned that 124 time form US speed figure in his prior start winning that allowance race in February. He had set a fast pace that day. His opening quarter mile uh, pace figure was a 143, I believe. So, I mean, they went, they really rated him to go slower this day. And, you know, I don't think it was necessarily to his benefit. 
benefit. I think that shows in the result. He lost this race and he might just be a better horse when he's sort of on the engine every step of the way because he's naturally faster than a horse like Surveillance, but sort of let that rival get into the race and they were sharing the lead, whereas Rivet probably is a horse that wants to build that confidence being out in front. Didn't get to do that here. And uh, Jackson Traveler, who probably is a cut below. I would say overall Jackson Traveler has sort of shown himself to be the third best horse in this race, but I just think the circumstances conspired to allow him to get this victory. And I agree, Tahano Twist, he deserves the highest time Formula Speed figure, um, getting that uh, biggest or the, the lowest pace deduction of anybody because we always do deduct for slow paces in uh, dirt sprints, but obviously he doesn't really deserve any deduction uh, for the fact that he was able to close into that slow pace. So it makes sense he would get the highest speed figure coming out of this race. I wonder what he could ever do in a race with a fast pace because it seems like Tejano Twist has bad luck of constantly finding himself in races that don't feature a lot of pace, but he comes with that reliable late run anyway. He's a really nice horse. Yeah, for sure. As I was scrolling through his PPs, only one time in a sprint did he get a fast early fraction, and that was an allowance race early last year where he, he was able to win pretty easily. So uh, I like what you said about the pace. Uh, one of the advantages of being a speed horse is it actually opening up a lead, and it's mind-boggling to me how many riders don't want to take advantage of that. Uh, if a horse is slow early, put as much space in between them as you can within reason. But we're just seeing less and less of that these days. Let's also talk about the other stakes event at Oaklawn Park on Saturday. That was for the three-year-old Phillies, the Purple Martin Stakes. And we saw a big breakout effort here from Asternia, who had showed improvement in her prior start when second at a similar level, but she came back here with a huge step forward and she kind of telegraphed it in her workouts coming into this race. It seemed like she was putting in some fast drills in the morning and she ran to that uh, early preparation here uh, by drawing off to win this race by more than five lengths. Hard to really project this improvement based on her prior form, Craig, but based on the evidence of this race, she's one of the best three-year-old Philly sprinters out there. Yeah, this was a fast race. I mean, I think it was only about a half second slower than the uh, stakes race, uh, the older male stakes race. And, and part of that was because of the pace. But part of it is she ran a pretty darn good race. Uh, she's going to wind up, well, she did wind up with a 112 time form U.S. speed figure, 109 final time. So really good effort from her. And I like last time she had kind of run off a little bit on the front end. She, she didn't run off, but she had things all her own way and still was run down by extreme diva this time she was able to rate a little bit off of a, a long shot in here just sit a little bit to her outside and that's a trip just a lot of speed horses seem to like and once they turn for home this race was over just a really good effort yeah, and I misspoke. That was actually an optional claiming dirt sprint that she was coming out of where Extreme Diva had beaten her, was able to turn the tables on that rival here and beat the rest in emphatic fashion. And uh, I would imagine that now the connections have to think about a race like the Eight Bells on Derby Day. I don't know if they'll run again before that, uh, but she seems like that kind of horse based on this speed figure. We've been talking about how the three-year-old fillies in general have not been running particularly fast numbers. And this is one of the fastest that we've seen so far from a horse outside of the Bob Baffert's stable. So uh, Asternia definitely in the mix for a race like that and sort of an interesting pedigree on this horse. It's more dirt on the dam side, but she is by Astern, who you think of as more of a turf, turf sprint sire. They've tried a bunch of things with her. They've tried grass with her. Uh, she actually won the turf uh, sprinting at Kentucky Downs last year. They tried going longer, but definitely seems like her niche is sprinting on the dirt. Yeah, no doubt. She has that high speed. Uh, definitely two turns didn't work out very well, but I wouldn't write her off as a turf sprinter either. Uh, often these horses can go back and forth between the two, but for the most part, the bigger races are going to be on the dirt. It was a little odd to see Flavie and Pratt at Oaklawn on Saturday, just given the fact that it wasn't one of the biggest weekends of their meet. But I guess he had some live mounts in both the Whitmore, which he won in the upset, and then in the following race when he was riding Rocket Can for Bill Mott, who was returning from his uh, layoff uh, going back to the spring of last year, having not run since finishing ninth in the Kentucky Derby. I mean, he was a horse that had shown some quality as a three-year-old, but hadn't necessarily shown himself to be one of the faster runners in that crop. Can back with a workmanlike performance off the layoff, Craig, I would say this was at least a step in the right direction because it was a career best speed figure for Rocket Can. 
Yeah, he ran a 116. Uh, that's what you want to see when a four-year-old comes back off a layoff. And particularly a horse like him, where I'm not sure the one-turn mile is exactly right up his alley. He's a horse who likes to come from decent amount off the pace, more a mid-pack closer type runner. And that's not always uh, the best style for those short stretch races at, at Oakland Park. But he got the job done uh, in actually fairly did it pretty easily once he turned from home he, he always looked like he was going to get it done and pulled away late so um the future looks pretty bright for this one yeah i wouldn't say that there was a ton behind him in this race at least in the second and third spots both of those horses were big prices but rocket can probably did run the best race considering that he got off a little bit slowly and had to make that steady advance from towards the back of the pack so like we're saying a step in the right direction he's going to have to do better uh if he's going to be competitive against graded stakes company in the future perhaps uh bill mod shipped him to oakland to have a race like the oakland handicap in mind we'll see how that all plays out and what the plans turn out to be for him but a good return effort and you know craig flavi and pratt uh a jockey that has sort of been in the Eclipse conversation for the past couple of years, but always, you know, for the second and third slot for many voters, not really, you know, earning the, the type of or accumulating the type of purse earnings to be considered the Eclipse Award winner. I wonder if the strategy is changing this year and maybe his agent is sort of going that Joel Rosario route that we saw a couple of seasons ago when he won the Eclipse to sort of, you know, base in California, but travel all over the country during the winter to try to really, you know, get some money in the bank when the big part of the season comes up. Because, you know, in past years, Flavi and Pratt has sort of stayed in California or, you know, had a slow winter. And then by the time they get to the major race in the summer, Arad Ortiz just has such a purse earning advantage on him that he really can't make it up because he just doesn't ride as many races as Irad. But, you know, I was looking up the purse earnings for this uh, point in the middle of March, and Flavian and Pratt is actually the leading earner in the country by almost a million dollars over Irad at this point. So I wonder if he's gunning for that Eclipse Award this year because he's certainly a jockey that has the talent to eventually get to that milestone. Yeah, that's a good point. It's something I didn't really think about, but it certainly seems to be the case. Like you said, normally he is strictly California this time of year until their meet ends later. And uh, so, yeah, looking forward to seeing how that turns out. He's certainly riding very well right now. Let's talk about one more race from that Oakland Park Saturday card early in the day. Race five, a high level allowance race won by another Randy Morse trainee taxed uh, this four-year-old filly who won the Black Eyed Susan last year. Hadn't gotten back to the winner's circle since then, but had run decently in a few races towards the end of last season. Coming back off the layoff here, and interesting that they elected to bring her back in a sprint race because this is a filly who actually debuted going longer, has never run shorter than a mile in her career until last Saturday, and she put in a strong late run from far off the pace to get the job done here. It was a really nice run. Now, she did get a pretty good setup. The early fraction was pretty crazy as the runner-up runner, uh, runner up really did run off, opening up almost four lengths early on the field in sub-22 fraction. But Tax just really cruised home, and it's not like she made this uh, – huge run late to get up. I mean, she was in contention by the time they started turning for home and just blew the field away. And the rest of the field was pretty much um, a parade. They, they changed spots just a little bit, but the one, two, three, four early runners finished two, three, four, five. It was only tax doing any real running late. Wasn't the strongest field we're ever going to see. She wound up with a 107 time form us speed figure 109 final time. Uh, but I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in the number. She looked good, and I would expect her to run much faster next time. And who knows? I mean, based on this effort, maybe she would try one turn, but she's had success at two as well. And you might have seen, if you kept watching the replay after the wire, that the Connections must have gotten permission to ride her out on the gallop out past the finish line. I think the Connections do have to get permission for jockeys to continue urging a horse after the wire. Uh, but they clearly were working her out an extra furlong to be ridden out to the seven furlong pole. And uh, you know, the, the, it's noted in the chart she went seven furlongs in 123.5 in this race. Uh, so just interesting. Obviously, uh, they were prepping for something longer doing this. Um, typically connections make that decision to gallop out past the wire in a race. If they're prepping for something a little longer. And I believe Randy Morris did say um, when interviewed by Paul LaDuke on America's day at the races afterwards, that they're thinking about the apple blossom for her next start. So they've got some big targets on the map. Uh, she's going to have to run faster, but obviously this was just a prep and you would expect a step forward going her preferred longer distance down the line. 
Yeah, that makes sense uh, because I hadn't realized the apple blossoms not being run until May this year. Uh, so that one surprised me a little when I was there and saw the stake schedule. Maybe they did that last year. I really don't remember. But just one of those I'm so used to it being run around the Arkansas Derby time. Uh, it took me by surprise. Yeah, I think they've been doing it for a couple of years now. They might have moved it a, uh, maybe a couple of times, but since they've extended this Oakland meet into May, I know that they've gapped out that stake schedule a little bit, so it's not all concentrated around uh, Arkansas Derby Week anymore. I think the Apple Blossom and the Oakland Handicap have been have been pushed back from where they used to be on the calendar. Let's move on to Gulfstream Park, where before we get to some of the bigger speed figures, we'll talk about two of the uh, stakes races run for the three-year-old sprinters on Saturday and Sunday. The Saturday feature was the Hutchison Craig. I know this was a race that you did a stakes preview for in my absence, and we had a favored winner of this race uh, with Beeline going out for the Riley Mott Barn. Probably not the impressive performance that people were looking for from this horse, but he was gutsy in victory. Yeah, he was. I thought it was a really game effort from him. He didn't quite match his debut speed figure when he ran a 109 time form U.S. number. Uh, only got a 104 here, but he's a horse who in both of his starts, he's had some pressure and, and responded pretty gamely. So I think this is one with some talent. He's going to have to get better if he's going to move into graded stakes company, but it was just his second start. And, and I like the attributes I've seen where this horse seems to be a fighter. Yeah, he definitely is. He's pretty game in his races. He got multiple challenges, came under pressure and responded well. Um, I mean, I guess the indictment against him is that the runner up in this race in promptude uh, was 26 to one and was coming out of a pair of victories against inferior competition with slower speed figures. He got the right kind of pace set up since it felt like this race was coming apart a little bit at the end, but still you would have expected a horse that earned the kind of debut speed figure that Beeline did to beat a horse like impromptu a little bit easier, but uh, we'll see if he can move forward against tougher company down the line. Yeah, and that 104 is just an estimate for me. And the real disappointment here was Valiant Force, the runner-up, I believe, in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Uh, he's they've tried him on. They tried to get him on dirt before uh, the, he was scratched late in that day. Uh, came back on turf and then tried dirt again after just a series of really fast workouts on the dirt, but just didn't seem to be the same horse on this surface. He ranged up like he was going to be dangerous in the lane and just kind of flattened out late. And I think I read after this race that the plan now is to go back to Europe with him. Obviously, uh, Ammo Racing, who is his owner, they have trainers in Europe and the U.S. So um, makes sense that a horse like this would be better suited to a campaign uh, in those sprint races overseas. The Sunday feature for same conditions was the Any Limit, a three-year-old filly sprinting six furlongs. This race, though, Craig, went post with just three runners, so don't want to spend a whole lot, lot of time talking about this one. Uh, we did see an ammo racing horny Delgado-trained winner of this race in launch, who has had an interesting career so far, uh, actually making her debut all the way back on May 5th in Ireland at Cork, uh, raced extensively in Europe through the early part of last summer, then went to Delaware Park to break her maiden, is now three for four, racing on dirt in the U.S. So a real globe-trotting filly here, but she caused the nice upset over uh, the, the runner-up R. Harper Rose, who uh, probably lost a race that she wasn't supposed to lose here. No, she was the heavy favorite in here, but good effort by launch. Uh, she's clearly like the dirt since coming to this country. She didn't have a lot of success on the turf, and she's one who I guess is is pretty good as far as the speed figure goes. Uh, I would estimate that it's going to be about a 108, so even faster than Beeline, uh, and pretty good for a three-year-old filly this time of year. Uh, it was just a three-horse field, but at least she did it the right way, and no real excuses for the heavy favorite at our Harper Rose, who just set the pace, was clear, and wasn't good enough to hold off launch. Let's go back to Saturday's card to talk about what was probably the most impressive performance out of South Florida last weekend, and that was turned in in race 10 on Saturday, an allowance race going the one-turn mile, won by the returning Bill Mott trainee, Arthur's Ride, a horse that had shown talent as a youngster, but hadn't been able to really keep himself on the racetrack. We saw him twice as a two-year-old, finished second both times, beaten by future stakes winners um, like Disarm and uh, Instant Coffee, came back for one 
don't start as a three-year-old going the same distance at Gulfstream Park and won in very fast time, but then went to the shelf again and now is returning from a 13-month layoff here. And boy, Craig, this course could not have been more impressive coming off that long break. Yeah, he was very good, uh, not just visually, but also I'm going to guess speed figure wise, I would say he's probably going to get around a 118 for the effort and just really impressive. I mean, it's a one turn mile. Uh, I would assume this horse maybe has plans to go longer. It's twice in a row. He's run one at the one turn mile and just did it very impressively. I mean, this race was never in doubt once he put away the uh, the horse chasing him, Furious Anger, who was a big long shot. And nobody was able to make it then as he just ran away through the stretch. I, I guess the big question is, is Bill Mott going to be able to keep him on the track? Because that's been an issue so far. And he had a bunch of works leading up to this race. So may maybe he's uh, getting them pretty fit the race did sort of fall apart behind him it looked like cape trafalgar was going to range up and issue a real challenge coming to the quarter pole but as soon as junior alvarado just sort of chirped to arthur's ride at the quarter pole he kicked into another gear and ended up drawing off under wraps to the final eighth of a mile i mean just from a visual standpoint this horse really looked good striding out through the finish line and like you said we'll see if they can keep him on the racetrack because if he's able to put a full campaign together you would imagine he's a horse that's ultimately going to relish two turns he's got a pedigree that says he wants to run all day being by Tappet, that producer of belmont stakes winners actually out of a dam who's by a belmont stakes winner and point given there's a ton of stamina running through this pedigree so uh we'll see if other arthur's ride is able to maybe tackle stakes company next time because it seems like he certainly earned his shot against tougher competition but this was an impressive return to the races off that very long layoff Let's talk about another horse that was returning for Bill Mott on Sunday. Though she did not win the race, I think a lot of people were anticipating the return of Scylla in a Sunday allowance event, also going the one-turn mile distance on the dirt. And even though Scylla lost to head bob here, Craig, I wouldn't say that she lost any stature in defeat because the winner of this race, Beth Stream, we know her pretty well. She's run some big speed figures in the past, and she has a tough one to beat at Gulfstream when she's on her game. Yes, she loves Gulfstream Park, and I would guess she's going to get about a 114 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, Scylla was just the neck behind, uh, so I would imagine it'd be something very similar, 113, 112, somewhere in there. Uh, so good effort, a good return to the races for, from her, from her, for her. She is the one I would want out of this one uh, compared to the top two, but uh, yeah, she was actually the one I wanted to highlight when I put this race on the rundown. Best stream, we, we've seen it from her before. She she pops some big ones at Gulfstream, not so much when she ships elsewhere, but she's tough over this oval. Yeah, and Beth Stream had everything uh, go right for her towards the front end. This was a slightly slower pace than we saw in that race that was won by Arthur's Ride. And uh, she was able to just get really game through the stretch, uh, build up that confidence around the far turn. And Scylla actually stuck her head in front at about the 16th pole, but uh, Beth Stream under Irad Ortiz was able to battle back for the victory. These two pulled a mile clear of the rest. So uh, that kind of legitimizes that solid speed figure. And, you know, I saw some people getting down on Scylla after this race, but I mean, she was a three year old last year earned a top speed figure of 109 coming off this layoff and proving five points that's a step in the right direction and this uh daughter of tappage who is out of close hatches the full sister to tacitus uh she hasn't yet gone two turns but i think she's a horse that you would imagine based on that pedigree is supposed to relish two turns when she ultimately gets to try it so uh she's one that you could easily project some improvement for in her second start off the layoff yeah, and I should also mention this is a race that's almost undoubtedly going to have blue fractions early. So Beth Stream's def Beth Stream definitely had things her own way. Let's move up to New York to talk about the feature race at Aqueduct from Saturday. That was the Cicada Stakes going six furlongs for the three-year-old Phillies and. The winner of this race, Craig, not beating a large field by any extent, but Galia Princess, even though there might not have been a whole lot behind her in this race, she seems like a pretty talented three-year-old filly for trainer Brad Cox. She had run well in defeat in her prior start when setting a fast pace and just losing to a good horse in Helena's Forte. Came back here against what was probably overmatched competition, but validated and even improved slightly on that speed figure up to a 111. 
Yeah, this was a good effort. This was the other day, race I did a race preview for, and it kind of looked like she had this field over a barrel. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of bragging for me. I went two for two, and I think they paid a grand total of about 640. But sometimes you don't want to bet against favorites. I mean, this just looked like a horse who it was almost impossible for her to lose. There was all the horses in the race were kind of horses that like to run on the front end. She had beat some of them before. She's faster. Uh, she drew the race. And in this case, I really liked what Manny Franco did is the horse to his uh, outside reconciled just seemed determined to get the lead. And he just kind of let her go, slipped outside and just sat off her flank. And once they turned for home, she exerted her class and it was all over. I mean, she's going to get a 111 time form U.S. speed figure for this win. So this one is a pretty fast sprinter along with that filly we saw at Oakland. Yeah, and more so with Galia Princess. I wonder if she's a horse that, as she matures, might be able to go some longer distances. Obviously, she's a horse that you know, Brad Cox has pointed to some shorter races right now. Otherwise, he would not have run her in a six furlong stakes race in her third career start. Brad Cox is a trainer that generally likes to stretch horses out when they're younger, uh, if he views them as being those types. But Galia Princess, I mean, she's got pedigree to go longer. She's by American Pharaoh. The dam, uh, Galia, actually won the Selwyn Park Oaks going two turns on the dirt. And she's a, this big strapping daughter of American Pharaoh. Sometimes you don't see the American Pharaohs necessarily be these bigger, muscled horses, but she definitely is that type. She just towered over her rivals from a physical stature standpoint on Saturday. So um, we'll see if uh, they decide to go longer with her down the line. But I think right now it does make sense to point to some of those sprint races is because uh, it seems like they could be open to a horse running as fast as she is right now. Let's move on to fairgrounds. Talk about a race that I sort of missed when it happened, Craig. I was in my <laughs> in my uh, sickness. I wasn't really watching a whole lot of races last week, at least in the middle part of the weekend. But as I was reviewing the charts and looking at the rundown that you sent, I was sort of uh, wowed by this uh, performance going six furlongs at fairgrounds on Thursday from Mr. Wireless, who um, sort of like Tax that we talked about earlier, interesting to turn him back because he really had almost never gone shorter in his career. I think just his career debut um, had he gone as short as six furlongs. But after that long series of routes, turning back to six furlongs here, sort of makes you wonder if Mr. Wireless should have been sprinting all along. <laughs> I sure hope they give him another chance because this was a really impressive effort. Uh, there were, I actually did the figures for this one and it caught me by surprise. I didn't see the race live, but as I was looking over the card, I mean, there was no denying it was a really fast race. Now, Mr. Wireless was kind of mid pack in this field and is a race with slow pace. All the fractions are coated in blue, but he was super impressive. He wound up with a 120 time form US speed figure. The final time number was a 128 in here. So just a really good race for him. And he's been a solid horse all along. I mean, he's made over a million dollars. So he's actually done just fine. But he's a horse who I think maybe give him another chance in sprints because this was just, it's worth watching if you haven't seen it. Yeah, you've got to run this horse in another sprint race, at least against Stakes Company, to see if he could be that kind of horse, because he was a nice dirt router, a grade three type on his best day, but he was a horse that sort of had developed that habit for picking up a lot of minor awards in these races through the winter at fairgrounds. But the turn of foot that he displayed in this sprint race, I mean, he didn't have trouble keeping up early. He you know sat a couple lengths off the pace, but the way he ranged up at the top of the stretch and the way he quickened up once they got into the lane and the turnover of his stride was just so much quicker in this sprint race than we had seen in his prior route races. I mean, he hung on his left lead for maybe a 16th of a mile longer than you'd want to see. But even when he switched over, he found another gear to spurt away from this field in the final eighth. And he was beating some really good horses. This this speed figure, it totally stands up to scrutiny, Craig. Cavode had been in good form for Chris Hartman coming into this race. And then horses like Ian Clover, Marcellus, and even Pro Occident who were third, fourth, and fifth, they had all run some nice speed figures on occasion in the past a few of them coming off layoffs in this spot but uh mr wireless just absolutely embarrassed them here winning this race by over four lengths uh you know i, I don't know what the plans are coming out of this race but I, I based on the speed figure that he ran and how weak this sprint division appears to be right now or at least how wide open it appears to be you've got to see if this could be a grade one quality sprinter 
Yep, that's what I would really like to see. I know, I know his his biggest wins came in, I think it was the West Virginia Derby and maybe the Indiana Derby, but you don't get spots like that anymore when you're an older horse, but there's plenty of spots in, in graded stake sprints. One more race to mention from the fairgrounds on Saturday was a maiden special weight event for the three-year-olds that went as race eight on their card. This one's sort of a borderline race for us to put on the rundown, but I think the first two finishers in this race might have some talent. Uh, this one was won by the Godolphin homebred Brad Cox trainee Cornishman, who was making the third start of his career, had debuted sprinting, then uh, lost in his first two turn attempt. I believe that was on Risen Star Day, and then uh, came back here uh, to get the victory, didn't win by that much, Craig, only about a half length in the end, but uh, definitely seemed like he always had this race in hand. And just watching him run, he's this big, powerful son of Curlin who seems like he's going to want to relish added ground in the future. Uh, so uh, I'll be interested to see what they ultimately decide to do with him. It seems that's what kind of why I wanted to talk about this race. He jumped up to a 108 time form US speed figure. Again, that's an estimate for me, but it's going to be a pretty quick race. And he just seems to be a horse who's getting better every single time out. And I also think he's going to relish uh, more distance, uh, which he'll probably get a chance to do pretty soon, I would imagine. It's obviously way too late for the tall Kentucky Derby, but people forget sometimes with these three-year-olds, there are a ton of races going forward, uh, plenty of time. And, and he seems like a horse who's going to do just develop more and more as the year goes on. Yeah. Typically you would say, Oh, this is a Belmont stakes horse for Brad Cox. But I think that uh, is a little different this year with the Belmont stakes being moved to Saratoga and shortened to a mile and a quarter. Typically you say that about horses that want to run all day and are going to get the mile and a half in a day and age where most horses don't seem to want to go that far. Um, I think the Belmont stakes is probably going to look very different from prior years this year, at least in terms of the, uh, the level of performance required to be successful. But uh, as for Cornishman, um, you know, in, in the immediate future, there are going to be some allowance races at Keeneland, maybe a race like the Lexington that they could test the waters to see how good he can be. But the runner up in this race, Craig, is another one that certainly has upside gun party who's sort of a, uh, deceptively named you would think he's by gun runner he's all also by curlin um and is bred very well out of the grade one acorn winning dam karina mia he's one that i think still would have a step forward in him he was sort of hanging on his left lead through the stretch from a physical standpoint he didn't quite measure up to um the size and scope of cornishman but he was taking a good late run at that rival in the late stages yeah, he's pretty good. I think he's a horse we had talked about his debut when just to touch one. And that one obviously has since come back to run a pretty good second in the uh, Gotham Stakes in New York. So that's proven to be a strong maiden race. And I'd be shocked if Gun Party's a maiden much longer. He's got some real talent. Well, one more race to talk about on the podcast this week as we go over to Laurel Park in Maryland to discuss the Johnson Memorial, their feature race from Saturday, and Shaft's Bullet, a five-year-old gelding who has you know, been winning his fair share of races and has run well on occasion, took a big step forward from a speed figure standpoint in this race to win quite decisively. And uh, Craig, I don't know if you have the final, the final number for this race just yet, but um, definitely seemed like he ran a fast one going the one-turn mile. Yeah, he did. I don't have the exact final number. I'll have that later today, but I imagine it's going to be around the 118 mark. And yeah, just a really nice race from him. He's still just a five-year-old, a five-year-old gelding. It's one of one of my favorites. Seems to be like peak time for uh, five-year-olds when they uh, really develop. And he seems like a horse who has some potential. He's one that's looking good. Now his main rival scratched out of here, Magic Michael, a horse who had beat him a couple times. But he turned the table last time uh, in an allowance race, maybe signaling that development and really took a step forward here. Yeah, and the horse that took all the money in this race, Nimitz Class, ever since a private purchase and trainer switch to George Weaver, just seems like it's not been working for him. He was also tailing off for the prior bar at the end of last year, but I mean, he's a horse who at one time would have uh, been pretty reliable to beat a field like this, but it just seems like um, Nimitz Class is not in peak form right now. So that made this race a little bit easier for a horse like Shaft's Bullet to cause the minor upset, but um, he obviously has taken a big step forward, and we've seen some nice speed figures coming out of Maryland lately. I mean, obviously, we talked about post time last month when he won the General George, and these horses are running the kind of numbers that suggest they could be competitive against um, tougher company out of town as we move into the springtime. So we'll see where both of those horses uh, end up in their subsequent starts. 
Well, that brings us to the end of this week's recap. Um, like we said at the top, not a ton of graded stakes to talk about this week. Not so many 120 plus time from US speed figures, but some nice horses that were returning, getting their campaigns off to uh, starts as four-year-olds or potentially older horses that I think there are some things to look forward to with a few of these runners moving into the rest of 2024, You know, especially those horses from the Bill Mott barn like Arthur's Ride and Scylla and, and even Mr. Wireless who we were talking about just now. Uh, I'll be really interested to see how these horses do when they move up into stakes company uh, in the coming months. Yeah, these these are almost sometimes the ones I like talking about the most because the, the big stakes are usually pretty obvious. We know all the horses. I, I like looking for the ones that a lot of people don't really know about or who have kind of been off the radar for a while. So good to have that small break. But that said, we're recording this on a Tuesday. Uh, it's time to get to work now because we get busy. Uh, we're going to be recording the for forecast early this week. We're uh, doing the fairgrounds, obviously, the big card. So once again, quite the card from them. And I'm pretty excited to get to handicapping this one. Yeah, I'll be uh, diving into that fairgrounds uh, pick five sequence later today. I think we're planning to get that forecast out maybe one day early this week uh, released on Thursday so uh, we'll uh, obviously put something out about that on on Twitter when uh, it's ready to go but uh, looking forward to, to that fairgrounds uh, podcast that uh, Louisiana Derby came up a really interesting race I'm sure we're going to talk a lot more about it when we get to the forecast but definitely looking forward to that a little bit later in the week for now everybody remember you can always listen to these podcasts on drf.com Apple Podcasts Spotify and YouTube wherever you get your podcast just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel. Again, everybody, thanks for listening to the PaceCast on this Tuesday, and make sure to catch that Time Form US forecast coming out in a couple of days.